Have you had trauma in childhood? Have you experienced any kind of trauma that has impacted your physiology or psychology? Trauma is a potent trigger in systems biology and biochemistry. It prevents you from sleeping and it prevents all healing. You might have every protocol in place and yet struggle to heal and trauma can be that missing piece of the puzzle. At one point, I believed I could not move past my traumas. You might be thinking that as well. You must take a listen to this potent conversation from start to finish. In today's episode, we will answer three questions. How do you define trauma to understand your body and mind? What are the three common ways which trauma impacts brain biochemistry? And can you move past lifelong trauma and heal completely? I could not think of anyone else but Dr. Amy for this conversation. Dr. Amy is a both certified preventive and addiction medicine physician with a double masters in biochemistry and public health. She is the founder and CEO of Trauma Healing Accelerated, where she provides education and courses for those wanting to hack their survival systems and accelerate their healing journey from trauma. And she specializes in trauma attachment and identifying and reversing the effect of those stored emotions in the body and on our health. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, author and yogini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Dr. Amy, it's a pleasure to have you. And um, this is a subject that I really would love to have a conversation about because I definitely have my share of traumas and I know that that's that one missing piece. Sometimes people just don't give that uh, view that we really need because it impacts healing in every way. You could be doing everything perfectly or diet, exercise and just not having the breakthrough whatever are your symptoms or conditions. Uh, and I think I... Um, spoke about this to somebody that no one can resolve their health issues unless they've addressed their trauma because somewhere it's always feeding their symptoms and conditions. I'm happy to be speaking about this today with you and you are a big expert on this subject. Um, What made you choose this path because this is such an interesting and much needed um, aspect of healing for our global society? I did not choose this. I did not, I did not plan for this. (laughs) This is something where uh, it's kind of like life has led me here. And part of my journey has been exactly that, right? Like I had my own health symptoms. I've had my own health journey and uh, realizing even as a medical physician and seeing all of my patients over the years that, wait a second, there's something missing here. And for me, Uh, I even came through one of the best medical schools for understanding the whole person and integrating mind and body. And yet I really, I did not know the depth to what that really meant until I started going and getting trained in different trauma therapies myself. And then it was like, oh my goodness, this is what it is because now I actually have eyes to see the nervous system, which is where trauma gets stored in the body. 
Um, and I have tools to address it because what would happen before is that I would see patients and, you know, like, as you're saying, right, like everybody, everybody really has had trauma, right? Like you, you cannot live in this world called earth and not experience trauma these days. And it's just how, how do we, how do we manage that? How do we address it? For most of us, since we don't even know that it has happened, we, we don't have that, um, that understanding of our body. We didn't get that manual for our body. Then we don't, we don't do anything about it. And then under the surface, it's affecting our symptoms. And so here I am and I'm seeing my patients and, and I'm seeing what you would call like an emotional aspect to their disease process. And what I was taught and most people uh, in the professional field are taught is like, what is standard of care is just to say, you know, hey, uh, you should, you should go see a therapist about this. Right. And, and for us, that means like being trauma informed. And that is, that is so far from enough. And so when I actually started uh, attending and, and getting trained in some of these different trauma therapies, it blew my mind how much I could do as a medical professional in the moment to actually help someone address their stored trauma and do it safely so that it wouldn't cause worsening of their physical health symptoms and start them on this process where they could then do a lot on their own and not have to rely on going in to see a therapist or certainly doing some modalities that may not be safe where they're talking about it, they're, they're bringing it up, but yet with not a real way to, to process it, to move through it, to have the body be able to unburden itself. And so it's just been a fascinating ride for me to go from very, very conventional medicine, very heavy in the sciences. And don't get me wrong. I still love the sciences. Uh, I still geek out over biology and biochemistry and proteins and molecules and DNA still geek out over that and being able to see exactly how much this stored trauma affects our biology and our proteins and our DNA and that we actually have some very powerful, simple, powerful tools to help the body address and unburden itself. Beautiful. And I loved what you said about that intersection that you still geek out on the science, because I truly, that's, the, that's what our whole podcast is about, that it's the intersection of science and the ancient wisdom as well. I mean, there's so many things that can come together. And I love that. Um, and maybe you could get us started talking a little bit about what exactly might constitute trauma, because sometimes people don't even understand identify something as a potential trauma. I know for me, uh, eight years in a bad marriage was a huge trauma. And there are times even today where some situation or some stressor, and then I find that at night, my heart is racing, I can't wind down, I feel anxious. And it's ripples keep coming up over time without, I mean, I can't even predict them. But so what would you constitute as trauma? I mean, um, and this, uh, I'm sure, goes back as far as adverse childhood experiences. It can, for sure. And how you describe it is exactly what trauma is and, and how it affects us when it gets stored in the body. It shows up in ways that we can't predict and we can't control. And so this really shows us how much it gets wired into the autonomic nervous system, which is the, all of the nerves in our body. It's not just our mind. It's not just our psychology or else we'd be able to, you know, change our thoughts. We'd be able to change our mindset and, and tell ourselves some affirmations or some mantras and, and we're good. And that's not, that's not how it works, right? This stuff shows up despite us doing those. And we find that our, our health and our life, our sleep is all really controlled by this unseen force that just kind of shows up when it wants to. And, and so how do we define trauma? We define trauma actually by what we see in the nervous system and the patterns that get stored into the nervous system when trauma gets, uh, has that lasting effect. And so when we look at something like stress versus trauma, that's a good way to start this conversation about, Hey, what is, what is trauma? And stress is, stress is something that stretches us. It challenges us. 
However, we're able to meet that challenge. We're able to meet that stretch and then be able to either have a greater capacity because we've done something bigger or we, we return to the same baseline of health that we had before that stretch. A trauma is going to push us over the edge. <laughs> it's going to not be a stretch so much as it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to push us over that line. And, and now rather than being something that increases our capacity, it actually makes us just have to push through something. And many people, most people, when they, when they think of, well, I just had to get through that. I just had to push through. I just, you know, I had to just get it done, go through the motions. They don't realize that that is a trauma pattern. And so most people walk around with stored trauma in their body, never knowing that it is there and how much of an effect that it is having on every aspect of their life. And so how would we recognize that? Well, kind of just what you were saying, right? Like you're going through your day, you're going through your life, and then whoop, pops up these emotions or these um, cravings or this impulse to do something or the um, just kind of the, the body crashing and, and going into this, I can't do this anymore. This is exhausting. I need to uh, reach for a coping mechanism in order to get through this. I remember so much of my life, and 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 I I also speak for, from personal experience because most of my life I have spent living in what I call a chronic functional free state, where it's so much of this stored trauma pattern that puts us chronically in this state of overwhelm, and the amount of coping mechanisms that I had to develop in order to get through my life. And it, they were everything from overeating, right? And not just overeating, but what were the foods that I was reaching for? I was reaching for those foods that would wake me up, that would give me some energy in order to get through one more task, to get through one more hour of work, to get through whatever I needed to do, right? And, and then I would also be reaching for like the caffeine and the carbohydrates and all of these other things that I know now were because I was struggling with low serotonin. I was struggling with low dopamine. That is one of the biology of trauma um, kind of aspects that, that I talk about and teach in my certification courses is how much of these brain chemicals can actually set someone up for being at risk of experiencing a trauma. And when you're going through a life experience and you have low serotonin or low dopamine, my goodness, things become overwhelming faster than someone else who's beside you and has normal levels of those neurotransmitters. And so, uh, but sometimes the trauma itself is what causes those neurotransmitters to be low as a downstream effect. Either way, right, at the end of the day, you find yourself craving carbohydrates, craving the sweets, craving the the caffeine or the other stimulants in order to give you that, that high energy in the moment to pull yourself out of the overwhelm and the exhaustion and to get stuff done. I also reached a lot for over-exercising. Uh, so over-exercising was another coping mechanism that I used quite a bit in order to deal with emotions. I didn't know that that's what I was using it for, but certainly looking back now, I can tell, oh my goodness, I didn't know how to feel sadness. I didn't know how to feel grief. I didn't know how to process that. I didn't know how to be present with those emotions. And so I would just get on my bike and I would ride and I would ride for miles and miles, 70 miles, a hundred miles until I was physically exhausted because I was more comfortable with physical pain than I was with emotional discomfort. And so one of the easy ways that we can identify these trauma patterns is looking at coping mechanisms, just like what I did in my life and being, do I, do I have coping mechanisms, right? <laughs> do I, do I use things in order to help me get through? And if, if the answer is yes, it's nothing bad. The trauma patterns are not bad. It's just an awareness that, oh, I actually may have trauma patterns in my nervous system and I did not even know it. Okay. Sleep is actually another coping mechanism. And so as I talk about the chronic functional free state, people who are in that state, 
they tend to want to sleep more and they are exhausted. Uh, there's just this heaviness to them, a heaviness to life. And many people describe both kind of this feeling of wanting to curl up in a ball and pull the blankets over their head, <laughs> or they wake up in the morning and they, they wish that they didn't wake up, right? They're like, is it morning already? Can't, can't I, can't I go back to sleep? I, I don't want to start my day. And so we start to see how these stored trauma patterns in the nervous system affect a person's sleep. And some of the really in cool insights that we can have about their sleep pattern and what it means for stored trauma in the nervous system. So what is trauma? Trauma is anything that overwhelmed us and that led to us needing to find things to help us get through. And that's a very broad definition, which really helps people to broaden their definition of trauma and start to look at different experiences in their life that at that time would have been overwhelming. Maybe if those same experiences happened right now with all of the life wisdom and life experience that you've accumulated, it wouldn't be overwhelming. But at that time in your life with the resources and the support that you had at that time, it was overwhelming. And it did make you a part of you just kind of like curl in and go into self-protect mode and kind of shut down and, and go into guarding and bracing um, in order to be able to get through an experience in life. And I do want to, before I would like to speak a little bit more about sleep, but you mentioned something which is really interesting about how people can overexercise. And I know that this is a huge trend and you see a lot of people in social media encouraging people to really push the limits. And it was exactly like how you described, I just keep going, going, going. Um, and someone might actually turn around and ask us what's wrong with overexercising. So can we speak a little bit about that? Because especially in the context of women, maybe is there a difference when we overexercise that would, I think we really need to discuss that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is huge. And I'm so glad that you're giving me the opportunity to dive a little deeper into this. So Let's look at the body as, as a machine, right? And the machine, it has a specific purpose and that is to survive, <laughs> right? Like our machine is designed to actually keep us alive, get us through life, whatever our lifespan is. And in order to do that, it needs certain things. It needs nutrients, just like a car needs gas, right? <laughs> we cannot expect a car to go down the road if it does not have gas and we've got to put gas into it. Well, our machine needs nutrients in order to help us best survive. And as we start to become depleted in certain nutrients, then it becomes even harder to push through to survive. And so when you look at over-exercising and what might be the danger in that, right? Like it served me well. Uh, it allows me to not have to pay for therapy. It allows me to, you know, like do all this stuff. Um, I feel fit. I feel strong. What's the problem? Here's, here's the problem. When we have this, uh, when we have this stored trauma in the nervous system, our cells are already in stress and survival mode which means that they're already using up more nutrients and kind of nearing that edge of, of being depleted. I want to think of specifically like magnesium and zinc and NAD, some of the B vitamins. And these are nutrients that are not only in the cell, but actually inside of those powerhouses that make our energy, which are called mitochondria. And when we go into stress mode, you can think of the car pushing that sport function on your car, <laughs> where not only now are we driving down the road, but we are racing down the road and we are using everything that we have to get us there faster. We are in sport mode. You can think of that as stress mode. And so our nervous system, our cells are utilizing all of our nutrients at a much faster pace. 
And then if you want to take that and say, all right, and now you're going to go and over exercise your cells, your nutrients are already on the edge of depletion of some of these very essential nutrients. And so when you overexercise, you're pushing your body to the limit and many times beyond the limit. And it may for a time be able to compensate and still get some of those nutrients from your diet, but over time it accumulates the deficit, right? And so now you're operating in the red and you're continuing to push yourself you are getting closer and closer each time to a major crash of your whole health system because you're going to run out of those essential nutrients just by the fact that how much you are revving your engine and not being able to put as many nutrients back in as you are using up. And I know that Dr. Amy, that recently I came across in the last one year, several clients who were on antidepressants like SSRIs for a very long time, and they were also supplement phobic. So they felt that there was something wrong in taking supplements and they didn't quite understand the role of micronutrients in mental health. And what you're saying is that typically when someone has trauma, also the likelihood of them needing uh, SSRI might be higher because you also described the low serotonin and the low dopamine early on. And uh, then this puts us into a vicious cycle where we are phobic to supplements, we're low in serotonin, we are pushing ourselves to deplete further. And then that's just setting ourselves up for mental health issues, I think. And um, do you feel that... Um, in terms of healing from trauma that nutrients do play a key role? So I have, um, I'm gonna say something bold here <laughs> for your audience. And that is, I have never seen someone on antidepressants or any mood medication who does not have stored trauma in their nervous system that, that comes hand in hand. And we can look at which came first, right? Did the low serotonin and low dopamine come first and then the trauma because that set them up for uh, being at higher risk or did the trauma happen? And because of that, then nutrients got, got used up more. And now we're dealing with low serotonin, and low dopamine. I don't know. And at this point, when I'm first working with somebody, I don't care. We've got to address both. At this point, we have to address the low serotonin and low dopamine if we're going to be able to get them up out of the, the hole that they've fallen into. But we're also having to deal with the stored trauma in the nervous system because that will continue to perpetuate the low serotonin and low dopamine. So when I look at the role of nutrients in trauma, trauma recovery, trauma therapy, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's essential. I have, I have never seen anybody be able to reverse and process and burden their body from stored trauma without looking at the essential nutrients that we always discover. There are some imbalances and deficits always. I even want to, uh, I'll say that there are, um, just, just looking at the brain neurotransmitters, there are three most common biochemical imbalances that I see that create those uh, imbalances in the brain chemistry and things like methylation. So methylation disorder is a big one that actually affects us on the DNA level and affects our serotonin and dopamine level. So I am, I am a strong undermethylator and undermethylators have low serotonin and low dopamine activity. If a person has undermethylation, right, like me, they have to address that if they're going to be successful at addressing the stored trauma in their body and not experiencing further stressful, traumatic events in their life. Because like I mentioned earlier, if you go into a, a situation, if you go into a life event with low serotonin and low dopamine, I guarantee you, you are going to experience it as a trauma, as overwhelming, 
just because your brain does not have the chemicals that it needs to feel safe and secure. And yeah, okay, this is stressful, but I got this. We, we can do this. It's going to quickly go into overwhelm of, no, I can't do this. I feel lost. I feel alone. And, and so we go into overwhelm and that overwhelm is, is the trauma. So the other ones, the other most common biochemical imbalances relate to copper and zinc. And so understanding what is your copper to zinc ratio, or even if your zinc levels are normal, if you even just have a high free, uh, a high percentage of free copper, that's going to be enough. So, uh, can, and then pyroluria. Is can the, is I the stop you for a second there? Because I yeah. know I want to talk about zinc and copper and what does this say for somebody who's plant-based? Yes. So I, um, I have not seen a necessarily a direct correlation between copper and zinc imbalances based on someone's diet. Uh, what I will say is that for those people who are in sympathetic mode and stressed a lot, the nervous system utilizes more zinc. And so that may be just a reason for a copper to zinc imbalance. Um, there are other reasons for a high copper something like even uh, it's not as common anymore, but at a time there were more uh, copper elements in the cooking utensils. And so some of the pans that you were using, right? You can get some copper from there. Uh, women who have an IUD, there's a copper IUD. I had that at one point and oh my goodness, did it mess my brain up, <laughs> right? It actually caused a lot of, a lot of problems. I had, I did not know yet about this whole copper to zinc ratio and what it would do to my brain chemistry and to the rest of my body. So just looking at the brain chemistry, a high copper is going to cause increased amounts of norepinephrine or adrenaline. So talk about putting you into sympathetic. So even if you don't have a reason to be stressed, you're going to have higher levels of adrenaline just because you have a high copper. And it also has some effects on the serotonin and dopamine, but just, it's amazing to see how much of these uh, biochemical imbalances really play a role in either causing us to experience trauma or keeping us stuck in these trauma patterns and not being able to actually process and change things simply because of what's going on in our biology. Let's talk about sleep and how does trauma actually impact. You did mention that at times the tendency is to sleep a lot and then not feel refreshed while waking up and covering up. But you just described the copper aspect as well when copper is high. And that happened to me a lot where I just, no matter what tools I used, and I come from long line of yoga, but there were times where I'd sit in bed, I would try to breathe that try to relax and that heart would be pounding away and the adrenaline I could feel I would describe adrenaline as buzzing in my fingertips uh, and there's nothing I could do I just couldn't have, I could have stayed up all night long in this high adrenaline state uh, so what can actually what's happening there um, and can it go both ways of course and uh, is there a solution to it at all? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really quite fascinating to see the different patterns of sleep that can emerge from this. Because when you look at stored trauma in the body, you can have sympathetic dominant people and you can have freeze dominant people. The sympathetic people are going to be in that high stress all the time. So they're going to have the high adrenaline. And it's going to be super hard for them to fall asleep because their thoughts just will not stop, <laughs> right? They're very anxious. They're stressed. They, they are, you know, going over different situations and what should I have said or what am I going to say and what does this mean? And they're, they're not going to be able to stop their thoughts and they may experience a lot of the buzzing that you're talking about because that, I mean, that is your nervous system. The nervous system gives you that buzzing type of feeling. And so for people who have the stored trauma patterns that result in more sympathetic dominant, they are going to have a very hard time falling asleep. And they may have a hard time falling back asleep when they wake up. So that's important to know. But then you look at the category of people who are, are have kind of gone from that stressed place and now they're in overwhelm. 
And they are the ones that just feel the heaviness all the time. And what's interesting is that they, um, they, they may have a hard time falling asleep just because they're, they're there, they're present, but they're, they're usually engaging in stuff that helps kind of keep them numbed out and disconnected. So what I see a lot of is like binge watching movies or on social media and just kind of scrolling, right? Like <laughs> mindlessly scrolling. Um, and yet those are the kind of things that will also stimulate their system enough to keep them awake. And so they may be ones that are, that are staying up later just because they're doing these things. And then when they fall asleep, it's just this out of this exhaustion and this heaviness. And they're the ones that may have a harder time getting started in the morning if they are in overwhelm in that chronic functional free state all the time. Honestly, though, what I see most of are people who go back and forth between the chronic freeze and the sympathetic all in one day. And so they may wake up very stressed and they, they may wake up being like, oh my goodness, I've got deadlines. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. And they jump out of bed and they run and they go as far as they can. And then they fall into exhaustion at the end of the day, right? They're, they're drinking coffee in order to get through the day. They're doing all this stuff. And then they get to the end of the day and they just kind of collapse. They sit down on the couch, they put their feet up, they grab a glass of wine, they turn on a movie or the news right? Like all of, all of these um, horrible things for the nervous system. <laughs> but at the end of the day, though, like they're coping mechanisms. So it's really helpful for us to notice, hey, what do you do at the end of the day? And let's be really clear about that's not really relaxation. You're actually going into a kind of a numbed, disconnected state. That's not restorative. Um, and so are, are we really relaxing in a way that feeds our nervous system so that we are ready for the, for the next day? Most times we are not, but in, in that circumstance, you can see different sleep patterns, uh, where a, a person may have a combination of sympathetic strong, and I've got the adrenaline and I can't stop my thoughts and the combination of the heaviness. And I don't want to get out of bed. I want to just lay here. And so we've got some different tools that help people with their nervous system. I don't know if this is something that you've experimented with in the past, but uh, sleeping with a weighted blanket can be really helpful for the nervous system when it is in that high sympathetic to just be able to uh, kind of have that compression and have that containment for the nervous system that helps it settle in. And, and shut down some of that oof, like floaty feeling. It's like that weighted blanket just brings you right into your body and can help. It doesn't help everybody, but that certainly has been one helpful tool. And there are a number of nutrients that also help, um, help with that adrenaline, right? So I, I used uh, L-theanine. It's a, it's a nutrient that actually blocks the downstream effects of adrenaline. It won't block it from being made, but it does block the downstream receptor. And so that was a way for me when I was first starting out and learning all of this, that I could fall asleep easier by, the, by using some of these different tools that, that allowed me to kind of be very strategic about, hey, I need to turn down this adrenaline so that I can sleep and get good sleep because without good sleep, you really do perpetuate this cycle of trauma patterns being being carried out in your body. Uh, I and I think we did discuss L-theanine in detail, including dosage on another episode with Shay Leonard, and I link that. So if people want to take a listen to the dose, but I would love to talk to you a little bit before we conclude about um, what are the steps in terms of food to get over trauma because uh, I know that for me specific, uh, I had certain requirements with protein. If I fell short, then it would uh, definitely impact me quite a bit. Uh, and I also see that a lot of people, a majority of clients are, uh, they think they have adequate protein and I'm always differentiating adequate versus optimal for healing. So I would love to get your thoughts before we get to the end of our show. Oh my goodness, this is a huge topic. <laughs> huge and so important. 
So I will kind of pick out some of the highlights that have been really essential for myself and those that I have helped on their healing journey. And when we look at diet, uh, it really does depend on kind of where you are on the stage of your healing journey. It's very different when you're first starting out and you've got all of these trauma patterns in your nervous system that are all over the place versus once you've done some work and your nervous system is actually more stable and then what is optimal. Um, and so I think that where I will start is even just talking about blood sugar levels. And oftentimes what happens is that because of the nutrients and the neurotransmitters that we are low in when it comes to trauma, that we do, we crave, we crave carbohydrates, we crave sugars, but we can also crave protein. And that can be really helpful to look at what are the foods that you are craving and when we're craving protein, it may be that we are deficient in some neurotransmitter or some something like that. When we're craving fats, some of these fats are really important for the cell membranes, for the whole nervous system that's surrounded by this fat myelin sheath. And so if we have imbalances in those, our body is naturally going to crave those types of things. And so craving ice cream may not just be because of the sugar, but also because of the fats. Right. And so it's, it's helpful to notice what foods am I craving that can help, help me know what are the deficiencies in internally in my biology that my body is trying to get more of. But this is also where testing can be really helpful because if we can test something and, and be able to identify exactly what you're deficient in, my goodness, then we can be very strategic and a lot of the cravings will go away. But what happens is that as we as we give into the cravings, because our brain tells us that we need this to survive, right? I don't know how, how much you have struggled with cravings over the years, but when I, when I was going through all of this, oh my goodness, like I felt like I was going to die if I did not eat that cookie. Uh, it wasn't just like, oh, I prefer to eat the cookie. No, it was like, I have to have it now. <laughs> and so um, what happens though, is that just with those changes in the blood sugar levels, it really affects the nervous system. And it will put the nervous system into a stress and overwhelm state. And so with high, when we, when we have like a high sugar load, then what happens is that our body releases a bunch of uh, insulin in order to get the sugar into the cells. That's what it's designed to do, right? Keep our sugar levels stable, but it has to release so much insulin that then the sugar levels drop and they don't necessarily even have to drop too low, but even just dropping too fast. And then our nervous system starts to freak out and it releases adrenaline and it puts us in stress mode. We may even experience some sweats, some uh, fast heart rate, and we start to crave sugars again. And, and so just by the fact that our sugar levels are going so high and then dropping so fast, that is what is kind of triggering all of this stored trauma in our body. And it doesn't even have to be anything emotional. It's just simply because of our diet and our sugar levels. And then we want to, we can look at other things. So you mentioned the protein for me, protein has been a huge, a huge thing, a uh, really big game changer for me. And I was uh, raised in um, with the understanding that actually high protein was a bad thing. And that, um, uh, I mean, even, even to the point where, you know, jokes were made about people who thought that you had to, uh, have, um, a certain amount of protein because, um, you know, that, that was just, it was just wrong and it's actually harmful and it's really just carbohydrates. And so, uh, growing into then my journey into helping my body and my nervous system, one of the things was protein. And I realized I had to come to the realization that I feel a lot better when I have more protein. Isn't that interesting? And, and actually more fat, obviously healthy, healthy protein and healthy fat. And what I found was that it stabilizes my blood sugar levels. And especially when I have higher protein and higher fat in the mornings, it helps stabilize my blood sugar levels for the whole rest of the day. And now all of this energy that I uh, that I felt was draining me from all of the sugar cravings. I now had like the sustained energy throughout the day by making these changes. And what I, what I, sorry, what I realized later was how, uh, being an undermethylator that I need more protein than other people. 
So that was a big realization for me and something that has really helped me with my with my trauma healing journey. I love it. There are even today I can't handle a breakfast which has higher grains, sugars or starches. I need to begin the day with the high protein and the high fat. Is that your dog behind you? <laughs> Uh, delivered a, a package and so she went into protection mode. Um, could you just, how about just describing your breakfast, lunch and dinner a little bit and then we'll get to the end of this show. So part of, um, part of my diet is also very um, intentional because of the biochemical imbalances that I have discovered for myself. One of those is being pyroluria. And so with that, I tend to not be hungry for breakfast at all. And I used to force myself to eat breakfast. And I also used to eat very carbohydrate complex carbs, trying to eat complex carbs, but very carbohydrate focused breakfast with lots of fruits, maybe oatmeal, granola, those kinds of things. So I have radically changed my diet and it has made such a big difference. I do not recommend intermittent fasting for people who are just starting their trauma healing journey because it's too much for their nervous system to go that long without uh, some carbohydrates and, and getting that kind of continual nourishment. But certainly where I am at in my journey, intermittent fasting is now a very helpful thing for my system. And so first thing in the morning, uh, well, first thing, meaning like within the first hour. So usually at about 30 minutes to an hour, I am having a cup of tea. So I brew my own yerba mate tea. And then I put in MCT oil. And I also uh, will put in some C60. And that's usually what I'm putting in there. Sometimes I will put in some of my lion's mane uh, powder in order to help with just, just maintaining, you know, good control over inflammation in my body, but, but that's it. So I am continuing my fast until usually about 11 o'clock in the morning. And then I am introducing some protein. And so I actually use, um, either almonds, almonds are something that I will reach for quite a bit, or I will have just some very simple, uh, cooked, uh, chicken in order to have a small amount. I'm not eating a large meal until about two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And then I'm eating until about, um, I'll eat then, and then I'll eat another meal about five or 5.30 in the evening. And then that's it. And for the rest of the evening, I am drinking tea. So I drink a lot of mint tea, chamomile tea, but I'm not eating more calories until the following day. And so I've got that period of time for intermittent fasting. And so uh, I'm not introducing, you know, the, the protein until about 11 o'clock in the morning, almonds, bulletproof bars or other or the chicken. And then in the afternoon, in the evening, that's when I'm introducing the vegetables. And then in, in the evening, I may even introduce some fruits like blueberries, uh, some fruits that I can tolerate that that have a lot of nutrients and, and those phytochemicals that really help with a lot of micronutrients but I'm, I'm leaving the, the carbohydrates for later in the day and really stacking protein and fat earlier in the day to help myself stabilize my blood sugar levels. Lovely, Dr. Amy. And could you just maybe share um, some tool that someone could get started with to support themselves through the trauma recovery process? And I know you also have a program and now it makes sense, Trauma Healing Accelerated. It makes so much sense after our conversation. So if you could just share a tool with us and then um, also where people can find you. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, there are lots of tools and, um, some of the ones that I can leave, leave with you and your audience would be probably around some of the tools around how to work directly with your nervous system. And so what I have found is that before we can dive deep into someone's biology, it's helpful to also address and just, just bring down the intensity of the ups and downs of the nervous system. And then we can really do so much more with the biology. And so some of the somatic tools and somatic just refers to the body, right? It's like the Latin word for tissues and, and tissues are where really the, the effects of stored trauma 
uh, play out. And so we want to be able to address those. And so uh, I have a whole course built around all of these somatic tools. But one of the very simple ones that we can do is just what I call a containment or support. And that would be um, kind of holding your heart. And so you can uh, kind of feel on your chest, like if, if you were to make contact with your heart, like where exactly would that be? Um, and I often encourage people to kind of exaggerate what it would not be, because sometimes it can be hard to figure out like what it, where would it be? So I'm like, start with your chest bone. Is that, is that making contact? Does that feel like it makes contact with your heart? For some people it may, for other people it's like, well, no, that does not feel like where my heart is. Okay. Well then move your, your hand or your fingers over just inch by inch until you just have that sense that, okay, now I've made contact with my heart. And as I do that, what I notice is that as I get closer, I get more of this sense of taking a deep breath. It's quite, quite interesting. Ah, and there is my spontaneous deep breath. So for me, that's a measure uh, of I've, I've done something that has reached my nervous system and helped shift it more towards parasympathetic. When we do intentional breathing, it's not, it's not the same as a spontaneous deep breath. Not to say that breath work is, is not helpful. It is. But when we're doing these kinds of exercises, having it be a spontaneous deep breath just means something that's significant that, ah, I've reached the spot that my nervous system says, yep, right there. And so then once you have that in place, what you can do is you can move your other hand um, either in your back and be like, where would it be that you could hold your heart? So you get the felt sense that you're actually holding your heart. And there's another deep breath for me. So I kind of feel like, yeah, when I have my hand there and for me, it, it almost feels like I'm, I'm not at the bottom of my ribs. I'm kind of right underneath my scapula and my fingertips reach to the middle of my spine. And that to me feels like I'm, I'm holding my heart on both sides. And for those people who have a felt sense that, um, that they feel alone, they feel unsupported, this is a really powerful exercise to just provide for themselves that felt sense of being held. Mm -hmm. And they can stay here for as long as they want, right? And they can do this exercise as many times a day as they want. I will, I will often find myself doing this whenever, whenever, just throughout my day when I'm even doing work or, and something happens and it's like, oh, that hurt my heart. It's like right there, I can go to holding my heart and this allows me to actually be present with that hurt rather than needing to reach for a coping mechanism like over exercising in order to um, distract myself from this feeling of, hey, my heart is hurting right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also it's very reassuring. It feels like a safe sense of touch. And I know that a lot of times certain trauma can be through uh, abuse and that makes us very cautious about touch and here it's something which is with ourselves and we can really connect to that and that feels reassuring and uh, safe um, yes where can people find you if they'd like to go through your program or just dive deeper into trauma yeah i have a lot of resources and information over on uh, our website so that would be traumahealingaccelerated.com and that is exactly what we do, right? Like the, the, we help you accelerate this journey of, of healing trauma. And we do it by addressing the biology of trauma and actually working with trauma on a cellular level. And so we do have a number of programs, but we also have a number, a large uh, library of free content and information for people just to learn more and go deeper with this. So that would be the best place, traumahealingaccelerated.com. Lovely. It was a pleasure having you and I really loved exploring so many aspects which sometimes are often ignored and then people just, I mean, we have so many tools in our hands with food and with the right form of exercise and we don't have to keep staying in that state and I can definitely speak about this being uh, amidst severe trauma and having moved past it that uh, we should not remain in that state forever. And it was really very reassuring having you here today. Thank you for your time and for sharing your wisdom. Um, I'm truly grateful for your words today.
Ah, well, thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you are doing in the world. It is very needed. In this conversation with Dr. Amy, we broke apart trauma from every perspective possible. Ripples of trauma lie deep within, surfacing when triggered. As someone who has personally been through trauma and who has struggled in many ways to navigate my physical and mental health, I can only say that there is so much that lies within our hands. Let me give you my perspective. I strongly believe that physiology influences psychology and it is much easier to begin with the body. If you carry trauma patterns, it can be very challenging to begin with meditation or mindset, although these are wonderful tools. Start with higher protein. The power of optimal protein in supporting you through deeper protocols for recovery are profound. As a clinician, I've seen time and time again that someone caught in the vicious cycle of trauma, antidepressants and being fearful of supplements is unable to break free and move forward. Increasing your protein, if your digestion and gut can handle it, is a great place to start. Let me know if it helps you in moving past trauma and restoring better sleep. Have a wonderful day. Hi everyone, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Just a reminder that this podcast is for information purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or otherwise qualified health professional. This information is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or the professional advice or services. If you are looking for personal help on your health journey, do seek out a qualified professional. Please do make your own healthcare decisions based upon your research and in partnership with a qualified healthcare professional. It is in no way intended as medical advice or a treatment or cure for any condition, be sure to always directly work with a qualified practitioner before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle that may feel out of your realm of comfort or understanding. If you are looking for an allied functional medicine practitioner, do seek out more information on www.phytothrive.com. It is important that you have someone who is qualified and understands your health personally in order to provide adequate care, especially when it comes to chronic health condition. Be sure to subscribe to the Sleep Whisperer podcast on your favorite podcast app to get each episode as soon as it launches.